Let the church say, amen. So beloved, let us first begin at the end because it is always good to begin with the end in mind. Because as Lewis Carroll has said, if you don't know where you are going, any road will get you there. So the end of today's scripture lesson is important. And the land had rest for 40 years. 40 years, the Bible's way of saying a long time. And the, re and the land had rest for 40 years. Rest, an action verb. The Hebrew word is shakat, meaning uh, to be quiet, to be tranquil, to be at peace, to lie still, to be undisturbed. And the land had rest for 40 years. After the fighting and the struggling and the warring and the battling, there is rest, a long peace where life is undisturbed, when there is quiet and wholeness and harmony and tranquility. This promises food for the soul, that peace is sure coming, that wholeness is still coming and tranquility is still coming and it will last for a long time. Yes, there remaineth a rest, the rest that God has promised us. When, when you are tired to the bone and exhausted to the core, rest is a sacred gift. And God knows that we are tired, tired of the way that things are and, and the way that things have been in these past months. And God knows that we are worn out by the way things have been for the past four years. And, and because we are tired of the same old, same old, we have been looking, we have been looking for alternative ways of being, alternative community, alternative modes and models of leadership, alternative ways of, of being in the world, other possibilities, other configurations, uh, different futures, alternative endings to this story. I want to write my own ending to the dystopian movie we're living right now, one where uh, freedom flourishes and life isn't so hard because life is just so hard right now. Alternative scenarios where a racial sensitivity Activity training isn't outlawed by a White House that despises Black lives, despite the fact that the White House's address is Black Lives Matter Plaza. When the nation is at war from Kenosha to Portland to Los Angeles to Louisiana, and the occupant of the White House on Black Lives Matter Plaza intentionally stokes the fire of a race war, we yearn to rest. We yearn to rest in. God's grace. When, when, when armed white militia brandish uh, rifles openly in American streets and, and unarmed folk are tear gas when they take to the streets to cry out enough is enough, we, like the Israelites of old, we cry out to the Lord for help because we need something new. We cry out for the grace that celebrates all lives because it celebrates Black life and confronts the sin that, that, that Black lives have too often been condemned and crushed under the weight of white supremacy. And although the killers of George Floyd and Ahmaud Arbery are facing a justice, the killers of Breonna Taylor still are at large. So we say her name, and we will continue to speak it until justice prevails. You see, beloved, this is what the late Reverend Gil Caldwell, a prophet and, and former pastor of Union, taught us, that, that the struggles of one are the struggles of all, and that the liberation of lesbians is, is caught up in the freedom of females, and the emancipation of African Americans is tied to the interests of immigrants. Reverend Caldwell taught us that our freedom is intersecting and interwoven and interconnected. So we cannot say George without saying Brianna. You see, the fullness 
of the lives of women too long have been overlooked and placed on the back burner and have had to play second fiddle to the stories of men. My God, we have a problem and, and, and it's so much worse than we think. And, and Friday's Washington Post, uh, we, we learned that, that nearly 250 women have been fatally shot by police since 2015. Do we know their names? Geraldine Townsend, age 72, Hannah Williams, age 17, Alteria Woods, age 21, Regina Nicholas, age 58, DeCynthia Clements, age 34, India Kager, age 27. We must say their names too. Because maybe, just maybe, if we say their names, we might see their faces. And if we see their faces, we might just acknowledge their humanity. And if we celebrate their humanity, we might, as a society, we might just start protecting their lives too. So that's our project, beloved, to tell a different story and to speak a different truth. So this is precisely why, as we look at the history books, of the Old Testament for the month of September, we will do so through the eyes of women. Yeah, if you don't know where you've been, then you can't really know where you're going. And George Santayana said, if you do not learn from the past, you're deemed to repeat its failures. In the Sunday sermon and on Wednesday Bible study, then we will peel open the biblical books of Joshua and Judges and Ruth and Samuel and Kings and Chronicles, Ezra, Nehemiah, and Esther, the history books of the Old Testament, and we will do so with a preferential option for the perspectives of women. Because if the future is female, then we have to acknowledge that the past has been male. Therefore, our task, our work together, beloved, is to unlearn this past in order to shape a better tomorrow. To unlearn this past in order to step into a different future. To move beyond history or his story to her story, her story, and we do so by telling her stories. So over the next four weeks, let us unlearn. As we spend time looking at four narratives about women whose her stories offer to us alternative paradigms of what's possible. Next week, we'll pray Hannah's prayer of perseverance. Then on the following Sunday, we will journey with Ruth and Naomi as we reimagine love and the power of companionship. And then we'll end September by looking at Queen Esther, who mobilizes her privilege for the good of her people. But today we begin with Deborah, the Deborah who sings a new song. And at the end of the Song of Deborah in chapter five of the book of Judges, we find that comforting refrain. And the land had rest for 40 years. Thanks to Deborah, the warrior judge who fought for her people. So that's the title of this message on wisdom, warfare, and the courage to rest. Can't you just picture Deborah sitting under her palm tree, the tree bearing her name? You see, Judges chapter five, verse uh, chapter four, verse five recounts that she used to sit under the palm of Deborah between Ramah and Bethel in the hill country, and the Israelites came up to her for judgment. She sat there, Mother Deborah, between Beth El, which means the house of God, 
the place where Jacob had his dream. Between Bethel and between Ramah, the city where Rachel, the wife of Jacob, wept. She sat there. Can't you just see her sitting under her palm tree? Between the patriarch's Jacob's house and the place where Rachel's tears watered the soil. And that's where Deborah governed Israel. And she brought peace to war and resolution to conflict. There she sat under the palm tree, a sign of tranquility. And there Deborah ushered in calm and made the cries of our inner child grow quiet as Mother Deborah sang the lullaby of her song. Can't you just hear Deborah singing, singing Angela's song? Be thou my vision, as she sat there. Especially verse two, be thou my wisdom, and thou my true word. I ever with thee, and thou with me, Lord. Thou and thou only, first in my heart, great God of heaven, my treasure, thou art. Deborah, the wise judge, there she sat under the palm tree, a sign of tranquility. On this Labor Day weekend, beloved, I hear the wisdom in Deborah's song as it still sings to us today. It's like music to our ears. Deborah shares her wisdom with the world and she offers to us a different vision, an alternative way of being and living in the world. She shares that wisdom, the wisdom to rest, the wisdom to rest. Rest is so very hard for us to experience because so much of our reality is so shaped by doing instead of being. God knows I still struggle to practice what I preach and that's why I keep preaching it. Because too often our worth gets wrapped up in our work and our output. And we work because too often we're trying to prove something to someone else or, or maybe we're trying to prove something to ourselves to prove that we're good enough or capable enough or smart enough or strong enough. So we work ourselves to the bone, to the point of exhaustion. Or we work to avoid the real work of healing and self-care. So we work so we don't have to feel the pain. Or maybe we work because the system just forces us to work in order uh, to pay the bills and, and make ends meet, so we, we have to struggle. Or maybe we actually can't find work because despite what the jobs report says, it's a pandemic and, and companies are not just hiring enough people, so when we can't find work, we, 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 we lose our feeling of, of self-worth. God knows that there's so much I want to say about Max Weber's classic texts, uh, the Protestant work ethic and the spirit of capitalism and how it literally constructs the, the cultural production of evil that Emily Towns writes about in her womanist ethics. But that's another sermon to be preached, a, a sermon about Walter Brueggemann's notion that Sabbath is resistance. Because unlike the ancient Israelites and our ancestors in the Americas, we are not slaves who are forced to work lest we lose our life. No, we are granted Sabbath rest. So I hear the end of Deborah's song and the land had rest for a long time. 
because we are divine beings like God created in God's image and the creator in the beginning while God was creating, God rested on the seventh day. And look, I make no pretense that taking rest is easy. But those enslaved Africans, they did teach us how to do it. Even in the midst of circumstances where agency and power and authority was narrow, they sang the spiritual. Steal away. This Black resilience and ingenuity is the genius that springs forth from the souls of Black folk to steal away and take a moment each day just to rest to read, to pray, meditate, to pause, and just breathe. Because God knows, God desires that we take care. And beloved, we have to take it to take care, to rest. So yes, beloved, this sermon is another invitation to sacred self-care, to listen to the wisdom of women like Deborah the judge, the governor, who sat under her palm tree and brought rest to the land. The sermon is another invitation to sacred self-care so that we might govern our lives by a different set of rules. That we might experience mother's wit and the womanist wisdom that offers healing to us. We pull up to the kitchen tables of the love feast. We have a bowl of a chicken noodle soup. We have a bite of the lemon pound cake and sweet potato pie, sweet bread, those home remedies. Be healed by the bombs of hoodoo and healing that only a mother knows, that we might sit in the gardens and spend time at the feet of women who know that yes, sometimes we just need to rest. Women who preach baby Sugg's sermon. She told them that the only grace they could have was the grace they could imagine. That if they could not see it, they could not have it that we might just love ourselves and rest on God's grace and rest in your belovedness. Because rest is simply our birthright. Sabbath is part of God's cosmic creation plan and God's salvation history. All right, so in order to have the strength to fight for our lives, God knows that we are fighting for our lives. We have to have that inner peace, right? That's the tension in the midst of Deborah's song. The warrior who brought peace to the land, right? That's the tension in the midst of song itself. 
because Plamen and Willie and Angela will tell you that even when you sing, that rest is built into the rhythm. Howard Thurman says that uh, music score that provides for no rest, no devolution of whole notes would be unbearable at long last. So there's no music without the silence and there is no peace without the fight. So I believe this is why Deborah sang when the battle was over, once Cicero was delivered into the hands of a woman. Deborah sang because while sometimes necessary, fighting is not God's intended plan. God's promise for us is rest. And the warrior judge Deborah, who fought to bring peace, the one who brought rest to the land, she sang of that future that is surely coming because there comes a time when spears will be turned to pruning hooks and, and swords to plowshares and the world will study war no more. Deborah, the judge, like Ginsburg and Sotomayor, had the courage to sing a different song, a song of freedom, because somewhere along the way, she realized, she realized something about herself. She realized her own worth, her own value, her own sacred worth as beloved of God. What courage she must have had. Sure, it's a courageous thing to fight. And we know that Deborah was a military commander and she, she had to have been strong. You see, she governed during a period of enormous upheaval in Israel during a period of great turmoil and trials and tribulations. Deborah, she ruled before the ages of kings like David and Solomon and Hezekiah. And, and she ruled after the time of great men, the period of patriarchs like Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and Joseph and Moses and Joshua. Yeah, she, she was a ruler during a time of unprecedented patriarchy. During a, a time when, when women were sent to the edges of the village when they were having their period. During a, a time when women were not eligible for the inheritance and, and they survived only on the charity of menfolk. She lived during a hard time. And in Bible study on this past Wednesday, we were captivated by Deborah's story. And many of us echoed Marie Blake's curiosity to know more about this warrior judge who governed Israel and who brought peace to the land. But the courage that is most striking to me about Deborah is neither her military might nor her prophetic power. The courage that is most compelling to me is how she judged by sitting under the palm tree that bore her name because it takes confidence and quiet strength to rest in the knowledge of who you are and whose you are. I encourage, right? Which means to take heart it has more to do with this than what you do with these. And courage has more to do with what's inside here than even what's up here. So unlearning is not merely a pursuit of the brain. Unlearning is a practice of the heart. And fighting the good fight of faith actually has something to do with Surrender. Surrendering to the beat of the heart and the pulse of the lifeblood 
that's already coursing through your veins. The grace that God gives. God's love for us. We don't have to work for, but just rest in to rest on God's grace, God's love for us, unearned, unmerited, to just rest in our belovedness, to sit in it under the tranquil palm tree and unlearn everything that stands against the truth that you are loved unconditionally as you are. And perfect though we may be, but created perfectly in the image of the God who loves us into freedom. So we're invited to rest in it because of all the women who fought for us so that we don't have to any longer fight the same battles that they did. So beloved, it's Labor Day. And just like the land had rest, so shall we. Next week, we turn to Hannah and we'll pray her prayer of perseverance with her. But today, we sing courageously with Deborah and we learn from her wisdom. The faith to surrender all. I rest my case. Amen.